we would like to welcome the Chief of Space Operations of the United States Space Force General, John W. J. Raymond. Thank welcome. You. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Susanna. And uh, what, a, what a great event this has been, and I'm truly, truly appreciative of the invitation to be here and to, and to share a few words. Mike, thanks for inviting, inviting me back uh, to participate in this uh, incredibly important conference. You know, it's not lost on me uh, that I'm the only chief of an independent space force. Uh, in, in the United States, there's a television show called Sesame Street, and one of these things isn't quite like the other. Uh, I, I, that kind of resonates with me right now, but it is also not lost on me. It's also not lost on me that many of you, many of you, uh, have responsibilities for space as part of your Air Force. And uh, uh, I thank you for that. You know, a lot has changed. A lot has changed since I last spoke here um, last year. Uh, the biggest thing that has changed is I'm not in the Pentagon taping this, uh, taping <laughs> my remarks in a conference room, and I actually get to be here in person to get to rekindle uh, friendships that are so important. Uh, and then to also make new friendships for the new folks that, are, that have taken their uh, positions since, uh, since last year. You know, in, 2020, in my 2021 virtual remarks, I highlighted uh, how the space domain had evolved over the last 20 years and how it had begun to show exceptional promise for new advancements in economic prosperity. I also spoke about the increased threats to security within the space domain. Let me tell you, those points have, have only gotten stronger and the threats are no, no longer theoretical. Across the world, countries are recognizing the importance of space and intensifying their focus on the domain. Over the past year or so, we have seen numerous partners stand up or in the process of standing up or establishing space-focused units or commands, including the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Germany, and Japan. Just a few weeks ago, Spain uh, changed the name of their Air Force to the Spanish Air and Space Force. Congratulations to all. NATO established the Space Center of Excellence at Ramstein Air Base, and last year approved the creation of a new Space Center of Excellence in Toulouse, France. Many countries have also released defense uh, space doctrines, strategies, visions, which clearly articulates to allies and adversaries like their national priorities as it relates to space. Venues like this conference are critical to ensuring we maintain our edge in space power so that we can deter conflict from starting or extending into space, and by doing so, deter conflict on the ground. As one of the, space, as one of the United States' oldest and closest space partners, the United Kingdom knows this well. And sir, I want to personally thank you, Mike, uh, for hosting this event, for bringing so many of us together, and also... Uh, for being a leading voice as we uh, elevate our collective space games. You know, uh, Mike um, wished the Air Force, or congratulated the Air Force on its 75th anniversary. We're about to get out of our terrible twos, and we're about, <laughs> and we're about to be three. And I will tell you, there has been no stronger partner. So thank you very much. Today, I'm going to focus my remarks on how I see the current security environment, the implications of that environment on the space domain, the steps the United States has taken to work with our allies and partners in the space domain, and we have made that a priority uh, from the day that we stood up on the 20th of December until now, and that's going to continue. Where we need to go next and how we will need to do so within a collective agreed-upon framework for the safe and professional use of the space domain. First, it is important to look through the lens of strategic competition between nation-states. I think you're going to hear some common themes uh, between all three of us, uh, the three remarks that we've provided. The rules-based international order established after the end of the World War II is under attack by regional and global competitors. These competitors seek to turn the global security system on its head, rewrite the rules in their favor, and according to their author authoritarian view of the world, this threatens global stability and efforts for peace. The United States and her allies and partners seek to maintain the system built on the ideals of freedom and democracy. And to that end, we recognize the inherent strength of our alliances, our partnerships, and dialogue and responsible norms of behavior in space. That is why our new national defense strategy focuses so clearly on the concept of integrated deterrence. 
It is a framework across all warfighting domains, theaters, and spectrum of conflict in collaboration with all instruments of national power and importantly, our allies and partners. Against this backdrop, the Space Force, as the United States' newest military branch, must protect and defend U.S. and allied interests on orbit and around the globe in this new warfighting domain. We recognize the character of war has changed with growing kinetic and non-kinetic threats across multiple domains and now explicitly against assets in space. And because space underpins the joint force, threats against space also threaten our ability to conduct operations in the air, on land, and at sea. And in fact, I'd be so bold to say that your air and space forces and your army and, and marine forces uh, are designed and their force structure is sized assuming assured access to space. And you can't assume that anymore. And without space, you risk losing. Therefore, we must be coalition-minded from the start. We are stronger together, and we, and we see clear advantages when we plan, train, and operate as a team. Luckily, we're not starting from scratch on this. Much has been done to, to build critical mission capabilities in areas such as space domain awareness. The United States alone cannot adequately monitor and track all the threats and all the objects in space. It is a global domain requiring global partnerships. This is why the Space Force increasingly uses data provided by allies and commercial companies to improve awareness of this domain and distribute vital data to the joint force, our interagency partners, and international allies and partners. U.S. Space Command has signed a large number of bilateral and multilateral agreements to collectively increase awareness of an increasingly vital domain for global economies and for collective security. For example, under a cooperative agreement with the United States, Canada shares access to its Sapphire satellite, a space-based optical sensor. Throughout this arrangement, Canada directly inserts data into the U.S. space surveillance network, enhancing our ability to monitor objects orbiting thousands of kilometers above the Earth. We seek to build upon these earlier efforts to integrate with our allies and partners. This is why we will continue to grow events like our Shriva War Game, now about to celebrate its 25th year anniversary with 140 participants and seven allied nations represented at the capstone event. The game is the Space Force's largest event to identify solutions to common challenges in advancing space support with an air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. I have personally participated in many Shriva War games, including the very first one 25 years ago. Some of my greatest learning moments have come from these games and from my interactions with our allies. We've implemented some real changes uh, from those learning mo moments, like the creation of a commercial integration cell or an advanced C2 capability. We've also worked to improve cooperation, coordination, interoperability by implementing the Combined Space Operations Division 2031, which we wrote in collaboration with six of our allies. This vision aims to ensure free use of space while encouraging responsible actions with an eye towards sustainability. Our competitors have taken the opposite approach, carelessly testing destructive low Earth orbit anti-satellite systems that have littered space with untold thousands of pieces of debris, with some remaining a hazard for hundreds of years. I'll repeat to this audience Vice President Kamala Harris's announcement last April that the United States commits not to conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. I would encourage others to adopt the same commitment and appreciate those that have already done so. The United States sees space as a new frontier for all instruments of our national power. Still, we go into this vision clear-eyed that we must be prepared to protect and defend our interests and those of our allies and partners. This is one of the core reasons for the establishment of the United States Space Force, and it is a task we take to heart. And it is why we must also increase our speed in fielding new systems and capabilities for a range of uses in space that are resilient capabilities, including space domain awareness, joint all domain command and control, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, a new missile warning, missile tracking system, assured position navigation and timing, as well as sufficient satellite communications uh, ca uh, capability and capacity for a global, uh, for a global uh, context. 
Perhaps more importantly, we recognize the need to field systems and capabilities as a team as well. Here too, we're not starting from scratch. Multilateral SATCOM arrangements, such as the wideband global satellite communication systems and similar arrangements, are certainly one model that allows us to have geographic diversity of space assets and ensures we have communication coverage around the globe, including remote areas such as the Arctic and polar regions. Hosted payload arrangements, including ongoing efforts with Norway and Japan, and in doing so, we build interoperability and benefit our uh, collective countries' space enterprises. These examples can serve as models for a truly allied by design force that ensures interoperability. Our space architectures must be resilient, complementary, and we must avoid duplication of effort. Our Space Warfighting Analysis Center is doing the design work uh, to make this transformation from uh, our current space architectures, again, to a more resilient, proliferated, diversified architecture. We're doing that work digitally, and we're sharing that with commercial industry, and we're sharing that with our closest partners. Beyond these shared fielded systems, international partnerships and design know-how are essential to maintaining our leading edge in research, development, and technological innovation. Working alone, we cannot expect to rapidly develop and field the kind of capabilities necessary to keep pace and at a price point that we can afford alone. But together, we can build more resilient integrated systems at speed and, and share costs. Systems that leverage each country's unique expertise while avoiding redundancy and duplication of effort will help ensure we keep our competitive advantage in space. We're already doing this through a variety, as I said earlier, of multi multilateral and bilateral efforts. One of, the largest, one of the largest initiatives is the 11 Nation Responsive Space Capabilities Memorandum of Understanding, a multilateral partnership that allows participants to collaborate on research, development projects, and they can, they can speed fielding of new capabilities. Speaking of speed, I think a lot of us uh, may uh, be a little surprised to see just how fast and how far commercial companies have, have come in fielding systems that are operationally relevant on today's battlefield. Some have said that the 1991 Gulf War was the first space war. It's clearly the first war where we integrated space capabilities into theater operations on the scale that we did, including SATCOM, GPS, a very fledgling GPS system, and, and missile warning. That set the stage for an overwhelming coalition victory. Now in 2022, some will say that the Russian-Ukraine conflict is the first conflict where a full spectrum of commercial space capabilities have had such an impact on the course of the war. I'll be the first to acknowledge that we still have a lot of learning to do as it relates uh, to, to uh, integrating commercial activities uh, across the full spectrum of conflict. That is why the Space Force established and plans to grow our commercial services program office out of Space Systems Command in Los Angeles, California. Finally, we also support a collective effort to establish a common international understanding of what constitutes unsafe, irresponsible, or threatening behavior in space, just like we've done in all other warfighting domains. All nations share an interest to ensuring the safety and sustainability of outer space activities. Establishing norms of behavior is integral to accurately identifying intent, escalating, and de-escalating together. Each of these points highlight the fundamental importance of our international partnerships in advancing and safeguarding our mutual prosperity, security, and superiority. In closing, I want to acknowledge and thank my fellow Air and Space Force Chiefs for your hard work elevating the importance of military space within your respective defense organizations and the partnerships that you've given our new service uh, to help us uh, uh, achieve as much as we've achieved in just a few, a few short years. Space continues to show a great potential for future global partnerships to spur new economic development, to help deter broader conflict on Earth, to enable strategic stability, and provide a domain of cooperation, collaboration, and achievement, but only if we can maintain safety, the safety and security of the domain. I look forward uh, to the rest of the today's event and going on to Riyadh. I thank you for allowing me to be here and allowing me an opportunity to share a few thoughts and look forward to serving with each and every one of you and continuing to foster these global partnerships. Sanford Supra.